Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Uh, it's a total pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's my first keynote. It's my first time in Israel. Um, and uh, as Shai mentioned, I'm a research and experiments engineer at Mozilla. Um, and I'm really excited to be sharing uh, with you today a little bit of what I've been working on. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm also a member of the Bokeh team. Bokeh is a data visualization library um, aimed at the PyData community, and I'm going to be showing you some visualizations today, and hopefully that'll give you a flavor of, of what it can do. And um, you know, one of the funny things about working on an open source library, we have over 100,000 downloads a month, but um, all we hear is, you know, the bug, you know, the bug reports and the questions on Stack Overflow. And so, if you're already using, um, if you're already using Bokeh in your work, I would love to hear from you. And please come and introduce yourself. That would be a total pleasure. Um, and so, uh, I left Anaconda and joined Mozilla at the uh, end of February. And not long after that, Mozilla had its uh, its 20th anniversary. So it's 20 years since Netscape released the source code. You know, released the source code. It was open sourced and released to the world. And Mozilla was born. And as part of that, the 20th anniversary, we had this, uh, we, we updated our manifesto. I think, I think working for an organization that has a manifesto is pretty cool. Um, and we added to, we added to it um, these, these, uh, these extra principles that we're committed to an internet that includes all peoples of the earth, that promotes civil discourse and individual, and elevates critical thinking, and that catalyzes working together for the common good. And, um, but the internet, I'm an engineer. Uh, I was originally a mechanical engineer, now a software engineer, and it's it's just you know copper and fiberglass and silicon and protocols and DNS and and somehow it emerges into this thing that can can catalyze um, co you know collaboration for the common good. And what is that? What is the internet? And I um, I think that's a really special question that I don't have an answer to, and I'm not going to answer today. So don't. Uh, it's not going to get super philosophical. Um, but um, I really do believe in the power of technology and software and the internet and communication to do, to do good in the world. Um, and I'm actually relatively new to being a software engineer. After university, I worked uh, in international development for nearly 10 years, and I got to work with some amazing people, and I got to work all over the world. Um, just one example, I used to work with this piece of software called OpenX Data, um, and it ran on Java-enabled phones. I don't know how many of you remember life before smartphones. Uh, they look something like this, and we ran this, we ran this tool that was like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms, but it ran on much less creepy phones, and, um, and it was deployed all around the world, and it did nothing more than um, do, do um, what would have been a paper survey, but do it on a phone. But that translates into massive cost reductions, real-time data, um, secure communication of data, and more accurate data. And so in Pakistan, the team I worked with, we did rabies surveillance. Um, in South Africa, it supported a national program of HIV monitoring. And it was just, it's a very simple thing, but it had this um, enormous power and enormous utility, and, and it was a real force for good in the world, even though it's just, it's, just a, it's just a survey tool. And many of the technology projects I got to work on um, were in public health um, and, and delivered incredible good. Um, but they, there are also lots of other examples. I could happily talk about the role um, access to information has in, in it reducing inequality in the world, um, or how the spread of mobile money has empowered women and done some amazing things in the recent years. We can talk about um, farmers, rich and poor, and how around the world technology and data can increase their yields and decrease the risks that they face by leveraging information and technology. Or we can talk about the utter and complete loss of privacy as a result of being followed around the internet by anonymous corporate entities and, um, and uh, possibly a few state actors and hackers to boot. And so um, this is the world that I have transitioned into, a dark, scary, all-seeing world from the, the good, happy days of, of wandering around working on, on uh, public health. And so that's what I want to talk to today. Let's talk about tracking technologies. And so hopefully many of you are aware that um, there's a lot of tracking on the internet. Facebook has been a lot in the news lately, at least in the US and Europe, um, in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, uh, just 
get them giving out our data well without our realizing and to people we didn't know about. We've also just had the launch of the EU's GDPR regulation, which is a law that means that at least 1% of the emails in your inbox have to do with privacy policies. And, um, but today we're going to take a look at, um, at what is completely legal um, and, commercial, and commercial tracking and what it looks like um, on your web browser. Um, my best friend. I spend a lot of time with my web browser, perhaps more time than with my husband. And, um, and so um, this is something I'm new to, um, but it's, it's, one of these, it's one of these things where we get to use the power of Python to dig into all sorts of cool things. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with cookies. Who's heard of cookies? That's what we like to see. Um, an HTTP cookie is a small piece of data that a server sends to the web browser. The browser probably stores it and then sends it back to the server the next time there's a request. And what that looks like under the hood is a simple key value, um, a key something like temp persistent user ID. They say naming things in software is hard. I think temp persistent user ID is a good, a good, uh, good nicely ambiguous uh, key value. Um, and then some, some kind of value, and then, and then that's also stored with the domain, and that, that domain is, the, the data is associated with the domain, and the browser will only send that data back to that domain. And perhaps you've, uh, you've dug into your preferences on your browser, and you've seen that there are a bunch of cookies on there, um, but perhaps you haven't seen what they um, what they actually you know look in, look like, um, but we're we're Pythonistas. We 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 can we can write code, um, so we can really dig in and look at this in much more detail. So let's jump into our first notebook. I'm an engineer. I like to code. There we go. Okay. So um, how many people here do use Firefox as their browser? Awesome. So all of you can uh, can go and run code like this today and. Uh, for those of you who don't, maybe after today I'll, you'll be more inclined to. Um, so you're going to somewhere on your computer there'll be your Firefox profile directory, and in there there'll be a um, there'll be a series of SQLite databases that hold all of the information about your browsing history. And um, we can Python because it's awesome has built-in SQLite um, access and uh, uh, yeah, built-in SQLite, and so we can go and read um, read those databases. And pandas, because it's awesome, can read SQL. And so once we pull that in, um, the exact specifics of what are up there, I kind of appreciate that the projector is pr preserving my privacy um, a little bit, because this is really run from my, uh, from my actual uh, uh, cookie folder. And so uh, we, can read in that, uh, we can read in that SQLite database, and we can look at all of the cookies that I have on my machine. And, um, I wonder how long that I wonder how long that table is. It's 5,700 cookies. I've only worked at Mozilla. This is my work laptop. I've worked there since the end of February. I've only had this laptop for three months, and there are 5,700 cookies uh, living on this laptop. Um, so I'm a I'm a viz person. That's that's me sort of through and through. So my next instinct is always to visualize it. We use the world's best, objectively, the world's best plotting library, uh, Bokeh, and um, we use the handy output notebook function, which lets us spit um, plots into our notebooks. We make a figure. We add some data straight from our data frame. We draw some um, we draw some things on it. We give it some labels, and this is what we have. This is my cookies increasing over the last three months. And so you can see when I started, uh, that's at the end of February, and you can see it's sort of slowly, slowly going up. And then on May 1st, you see that vertical line. Does anyone want to guess what happened on May 1st? Uh, did I log into Facebook? That's a great question. No, um, the, uh, I think that's one of the later dips. Um, no, hopefully, my sincere hope, and we can talk about this later, is that GDPR will have the opposite effect. What I did is I sacrificed my privacy at the altar of the keynote gods, and I decided to see what would happen if I turned off um, third party, if I turned back on third party cookies. So I had, I had turned them off, um, uh, which is not always done by default. I turned them off because I thought that was a sensible thing to do, and I thought, well, you know, let's see what happens. I'm giving a, I'm giving a talk about tracking, and um, it was more, more horrifying than I can possibly have imagined. And so this is um, that flat line is is what it looked like with um, 
without third-party cookies, and that steep line uh, is, is the addition of another 4,000 cookies over the last month. Um, and so, uh, again, using pandas, we can, uh, we, can, we can group those all up by domain. And we can, uh, we can see at the top there I have Rubicon project, and then Insight Express AI, Pubmatic. Um, and that top 10, I only recognize a few of those domains. And so if we go back to Rubicon project with its 88 cookies, um, uh, they, they're the most, they, they're occupying the most space per domain. Um, who are they? I went and found them on Twitter. Um, they are uh, engineering the world's largest independent advertising database serving a billion users worldwide. I think the use of serving in that, uh, in that expression is, is a little awkward. Um, they're a real company based in LA. They trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but actually, um, despite being a native English speaker, my English isn't that good. And uh, I hadn't heard the word Rubicon before. And so I looked it up. Um, I wish you could make stuff up like this. Rubicon, a point of no return. Once you've crossed the Rubicon, there's no going back. Well, that's filled me with confidence. And at this point, the talk was starting to write itself, and I was uh, um, feeling better about things. And so here we are with our 5,700 cookies. And um, we, uh, we, can, we can dig into this a little bit more, and we can use a, um, we can use a list um, from Disconnect Me, um, which is a, an open source browser extension that um, is one of these privacy extensions that's available to us. And um, we can then categorize uh, all of those cookies um, into the various categories that they already have like, made for us in their list, and you can go and check that list out. And so of those, of those 5,000, well over 1,000 are in categories that they, they allow blocking of. Um, there's a big chunk there that's uncategorized and um, we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. Um, but you can delete your cookies, right? No. Everybody who's watched any crime show knows that you do not find the bad guy within the first 10 minutes. It's going to be it's going to be somebody else. So I'd like to introduce you to um, Zombie Cookie and Cookie Sync. And these two little scamps, uh, and when they get together, they completely destroy your privacy. And um, Cookie Sync is sad because it doesn't have as cool a name as Zombie Cookie. Um, we'll start with cookie syncing. Um, it's the process by which two different trackers link IDs, so, um, link IDs so that uh, across across a given user. So they're they're operating in different spaces, but now they're starting to share information. And um, uh, Stephen Eng Engelhart wrote, all of these slides will be available and you'll be able to click on the links. Um, Stephen Engelhart wrote a nice article about cookie syncing. Um, but so did Google, because you can use their handy cookie matching service to do all of the cookie syncing that you want to. This is not some weird practice that only little, you know, shady organizations do. This is the backbone of how real-time bidding works on, um, on you know, any, many websites that you go to today. And so, can we, can we go and see any evidence of syncing um, uh, in, in our data? Okay, so we're back with the same thankfully fuzzed um, table of my, uh, my cookies, the domains and the values. And we're trying to find out um, if, if, if domains, which I'm using different domains as a proxy for different trackers, um, it's a simple assumption to start with, um, are they sharing IDs? So we can, we can get all of the unique IDs, um, and we can do, this is some terrible pandas code. This is not optimal, but it works, it's simple. The data set on your laptop is small, at least in the first three months you use a laptop. I don't even want to know what it'll be like after a year. And so we can just loop, loop through, um, we can just loop through those, uh, those values and we can look and see if other values contain that string within them because they might not be exactly matching. Um, and then we come up with some ideas and maybe we, we only keep things that are longer than 10 characters and don't have com in them. Um, I didn't just magically know this was, I futzed around with it for a while, but it didn't take too long to get to a list of 29 IDs that looked, that looked promising. And I'd already selected for things where there was more than five domains uh, were, had evidence of that. And so, um, this slide is not very helpful anymore because you really can't read it. But uh, I wanted to show that these, this, this, uh, 
this ID here, which was the ID we were looking for, and then we can see it embedded in these different domain cookie values, but not, not specifically, it, it's embedded within the, within the, uh, within the values. Um, whoops. And so, so can we see cookie syncing? Uh, we haven't quite got enough evidence yet. Cliffhanger moment. Um, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a brief pause here because, um, as if I'm not nervous enough already, the second half of this talk makes me much more nervous and I want to just take a little sort of interlude of not trying to make my code work um, and talk about um, and talk about skilling up as a data scientist and um, and because the second half of this, like up until this point, um, ooh, how do I, hang on, yes, up until this point, the stuff, the code that you've seen is stuff that um, since I became a software engineer in 2012, I've built up over time. It's just some basic Python, a little bit of JavaScript knowledge, um, pandas that I learned almost entirely from this amazing PyCon tutorial that uh, Brandon Rhodes did. So I know there's a bunch of PyData people in here. I was in the PyData room yesterday. It was awesome to see so many people. So that, that pandas code looked familiar. If you're not familiar with pandas and you're interested, this is a very good tutorial that'll just get you that core of, of how, to, how to get started with pandas. Um, and Bokeh, obviously I know, I know Bokeh pretty well at this point. Um, and so, um, but, but moving forward, I'm in this transition phase and I'm moving from becoming a software engineer um, into, into working, doing data analysis, uh, doing machine learning, and, um, and it's, still, it's still very much a work in progress. And getting started with something new is a constant trade-off between um, you know, doing your own research and trying to figure stuff out by yourself, but also, you know, asking questions of people to keep yourself moving. And, um, and I think it falls into the sort of like three pillars. One is just all of the amazing resources that are out there. Um, PyVideo.org, which has, I mean, it's basically how I taught myself Python. It's almost every PyCon talk ever given. Um, there's books. Um, and then, and so you can read those things and, and you, um, you kind of go through this iterative approach where when you're looking at books and videos, you get this sort of big, broad background kind of knowledge about all these random topics that are out there. Um, and you sort of build up this vocabulary, but um, it's only when you dig deeper and you start to do an actual project and you start to really drill in on something that you build up that sort of very specific knowledge and you push yourself to actually be useful. And so it's sort of like you paint this big, broad stroke over a canvas and then you start filling in this tiny, tiny little detail. And it's funny, I'm one of those people that's prone to, I, to get a little overconfident sometimes. Luckily, software engineering has a way of really knocking that out of you. But um, the, uh, you, can, um, you can sort of, you, you get kind of good in that little area you're working on and you, you climb up your little mini learning hill and you, you start to think you've got it. And I remember being at um, my first PyCon, um, I was six months into my first job as a, as a software engineer and, um, and it was PyCon 2013, I think. And, um, and I, uh, and I went to this talk about PDB, and I was just like, oh my god, this tool is so cool. I have to tell all of my colleagues, who are all like seasoned, seasoned Python developers, I have to tell them about PDB immediately. This is very exciting, they must know. And um, they're very, very nice people, and they wrote back like, oh cool, yeah, nice, thanks. And, uh, and as, as the months went on after this, and I slowly became more proficient in Python, I realized that PDB is something that, a professional programmer, a professional Python programmer basically uses every day and has been built into Python since the beginning and um, they had been very gracious about my just like random like, whoa, check out this thing and like, but it was totally missing the mark and you know, when you're in that little like, like hill of knowledge that you've accumulated, you can sometimes, it's easy to forget that there's this enormous landscape um, of, of knowledge out there and, um, and that's why people are really important and they, um, um, if you can find a way to hear feedback and criticism and to, uh, to, and to get guidance, which is not a strong suit of mine personally, but um, I recognize how important it is, um, it's a way to really to get going faster and to get off your local, um, uh, to get off your local maxima and to start exploring new fields and to start filling in more of that canvas as quickly as possible. And that's why I wanted to throw this here in the middle, um, because uh, 
I'm right at the start of that journey, and I know that I am in the middle of making a PDB mistake or um, writing some code that I'm going to look back in just two weeks and cringe about how bad it is, um, or I'm still Googling just insane things on the internet, like we all do, that make no sense, and much later you realize why that, you know, that, that Google search just meant no, uh, just made no sense. I meant search, I did not mean to use a specific branded uh, search engine. Uh, it's a really bad habit that I'm trying to undo. Um, and so, and so uh, I, um, at the end of the talk today, I will have some ways uh, where I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas and feedback and thoughts, and I have some specific ways that uh, maybe we could even collaborate on some of these topics. So, back to our story. Um, can we see cookie syncing? Uh, we have our IDs, we've found them in, uh, we found the matching ones, and uh, now we can, I decided to use Network X to, to make a little graph, um, and obviously the world's best plotting library, um, and some very beautiful code that um, I won't show for now, it's, you know, um, uh, to, to make our first visualization. And so all of the dots, can I highlight this? All of these dots around the edge here are different domains, and uh, each of the different colors is a different ID. Um, and it, this is pretty fun to actually explore like this, but I think um, this other layout is a little bit clearer. Um, so we have these two communities over here where they're all sharing an ID, but actually those points turn out to be like, this is the whole like media, um, Wikimedia group of like family of, of websites. And up here, this is another family of websites that's all to do with scientific publishing and I recognize. And this hot mess in here is the entire rest of the internet that I've been browsing for the last uh, uh, three months. Um, and you see um, those same advertising uh, domains coming up as these central points with links going out in all different colors. And so I think, um, I think we can see evidence of syncing. Um, and uh, it's not conclusive evidence. Um, so, you know, the, the, the real, the, the, the really, Nasty part of syncing is the bit we will never see. It's the bit that happens server side when companies sell your data to each other and rejoin it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, back to our second, our second little scamp, uh, the zombie cookie, which is a cookie that is recreated after deletion. I like deletion as a metaphor for death. Um, and uh, by storing, uh, by, and, and it does this, this happens by storing cookie data, that data we've been exploring, into other kinds of storage on the browser. And so can we see uh, any evidence of zombies? The part one, part two might be a giveaway, but anyway. Um, so the first thing we do, uh, same thing as before, we go and we, we look at our SQLite databases that Firefox gives us access to, and this time we go and look in our local storage one. And we have that same list of 29 IDs that we've already, uh, we've already found, and then we can loop through them and see if any of them are in local storage. And lo and behold, there's two. And once again, I just tried this, and there it was, and I, I was like, you know, it, it was, I really thought I was kind of internet savvy, and then the fact that this was so just there on my machine after such a few, uh, such a short amount of time was really um, kind of disturbing to me. Um, so we found our two, um, uh, we found some, some candidates uh, for, for, zombie, uh, for zombie cookieing, and um, apologies that you can't read this table, but this, uh, for this ID that you see at the top there, these, uh, you, can, you can read the domains that have stored that value um, on the thing. And the one at the top is the LA Times. And I know I've been going to the LA Times a lot recently because they, they caught a serial killer with data science in uh, the Golden State Killer was caught recently in, um, in California, and I've been following it kind of um, obsessively, is that the word? Yeah, I think that might be the word. Um, and um, so, uh, so, so then I did an experiment um, and I created a new clean Firefox profile with just nothing in it. And I went and uh, I read in the cookie database after just opening Firefox once, and there's just eight cookies there. It's kind of surprising there's eight cookies when you literally haven't browsed the internet, but there we go, there's eight cookies. Um, uh, and then I went to the LA Times. And I went and I read the cookie table in again, and I went and looked for that ID in our cookie table because we're now, oh, I'm sorry, I missed an important step. Oh, 
ruined the punchline. Um, so I went and I opened my uh, I went and I opened my uh, my browser, just got my eight cookies, and then I just copied across the local storage file um, from my old profile to my new profile. So this is simulating if you've kind of wiped everything else, you've wiped your cookies, you've cleaned out all that good stuff. Um, but so I've just got that one file now from from. Uh, uh, for, that I've copied across from the LA Times. So I go to the LA Times, I look for that ID back in, my, back in the cookie table, and, uh, and it's not there. And uh, yay! But of course I'm kind of disappointed, I'm writing this talk to terrify you all. Um, and I thought, but I haven't actually been to a story yet. And it's when you go to a story that there's all that junk and the clickbait things at the bottom and the side and whatever. So I thought, I'll click on a story. And lo and behold, there it was. That cookie had, there were now two cookies with that same ID back in my cookie store. And once those cookies are back in the cookie store, we've already discussed the cookie syncing, which is now means that all of the, that profile, my new fresh, fresh profile can now be rejoined up very straightforward and automatically behind the scenes as all of these players reassociate my ID back together. Um, so, da -da -da -da. So if you, uh, if you go to any privacy policy, they'll say something, I'm not picking on LinkedIn, they just had the most succinct like, version of, of the cynicism that I'm pointing out. It's just a small file placed on your device to enable features and functionality. It also enables companies to compile your browsing history and your online behavior. But that's rarely mentioned in the privacy policies. Um, do you care? I, I know I do. I, uh, I'm going to give you all this code, and, and I encourage you to go and run this code, but there is absolutely no way I'm giving you my, my browsing history. You can go and create your own creepy browsing history and look at it yourself. Like, I, it's, it's personal, and uh, you know, we're all weird in our own ways, and you know, we should have the opportunity to choose who we share that with. Um, but as more and more data uh, gets created, maybe this gets to your level of creepy threshold, or maybe you start to care if when that data gets stolen, and it will get stolen, or maybe you just care if, because people now know everything about your behavior and they know that I really love rock climbing, but Andrew is kind of like, he's kind of met about it. So I'm gonna get charged 20% more for those rock climbing shoes. Andrew's gonna get the sweet discount offer because like he's a bit more on the fence, but like I'm buying the shoes. Um, so yeah, and this is again a real phenomenon. It's a thing we can see. So um, maybe that's not enough for you. Um, Maybe the fact that your browsing history can and is connected to your real world identity is, um, is the problem that you care about. Now, we make this very easy for, um, for companies. We are just all over the place linking our online behaviors and our um, real world behaviors. And, um, but in case you're one of those smart people who's never, ever been on social media ever, like Richard Stallman and... Richard Stallman. <laughs> and one other person, maybe, uh, and then, uh, then don't worry because somebody else is gonna do it for you. Axiom uh, proudly claims to have the most accurate and descriptive database on over two and a half billion addressable, addressable consumers. With their privacy compliant matching, matching your offline identity to your online identity. I'm not sure what privacy compliant matching means, but it is some amazing BS that they have managed to uh, uh, sort of strike together. And there's a whole industry that does this. Axiom, is, Axiom has a billion dollars a year in revenue. They are not a small company. And the whole industry is called identity resolution. And you can read fascinating reports like the strategic role of identity resolution in your new marketing, blah, blah, blah. And um, it's, it's horrifying, but it's, it's, it's out in the open. Maybe even some of you are employed in this industry, but for me, I don't know what rock I'd been living under, but it was, it was a really nice place, and um, I kind of <laughs> wish I could go back there. Um, so, uh, so, so your cookies give up your browsing history. Fine. You would never use cookies again. You'll type your password in every time you want to log into a website, um, and you'll never use cookies again. But, again, we've got some time left in this talk. Um, your browsing history is what's leading to your identity. It's not literally the cookies that are giving you up. It's your, it's your browsing history that is, is the thing that's connecting to your, to your identity and is enabling, and, is what, and it's the identity that is what 
is worth money, and that's why people are plowing dollars into finding it. Um, so is there anything else potentially on in the internet, in the world, that could give up your browsing history? It is, of course, the language we all love to hate, JavaScript. Um, and um, ironically, I started working and fell in love with Bokeh because it was an online web-based visualization library that didn't require you to write JavaScript. You could write Python and get web-based visualizations. And then I became a core developer and I ended up exclusively writing JavaScript so other people didn't have to. And, but what, what are you going to do? Um, and so this is where my team comes in. This is the systems research group. Um, I used to think that two of the three, two of the five of us were like a bit oversensitive about privacy, but now I come to realize they're the smart ones. Um, so there's Martin and Dave on the left, if you don't recognize their faces. And then there's Victor, Fred, and, and myself. And we've been working on a project uh, that we've, uh, we've called Overscripted. And, um, in November last year, we, uh, we seeded a, a list from the Alexa top 10,000. That's the top, the most, 10,000 most popular websites as of November 2017. And we, we picked a, a million locations and we went and visited them. And then we recorded all the JavaScript, not, not quite all, we recorded most of the JavaScript that was executed on it every time we, when we went to each of those 1 million locations. And that resulted in 131 million JavaScript calls being recorded. Um, and we also did this in collaboration uh, with some UCOSP students. UCOSP is a, uh, is a, I've forgotten what it stands for, but some very nice Canadian undergraduate students get to work on open source projects. Oh, it's probably, I don't know. Anyway, um, the, and they get to work on an open source project for a semester. And so the first batch uh, helped set up the crawl. And then the, the second batch uh, started to look at this data and started to dig into um, some other creepy things that happen on the internet that we don't even have time for today, like session replay, um, which is an amazing way of extracting your passwords and your medical information and all kinds of stuff that you thought was actually private from websites, uh, crypto jacking and other things. And so today we've released a blog post on hacks.mozilla.com org um, explaining um, uh, uh, talking about the work that they did and the analysis that they've done already on this um, on this data set and uh, this is where I came into the data um, uh, and so my first job was downloading processing and cleaning the data and this was absolutely where my first time working with data of this size so the raw data was two million blobs of JSON, um, not clean. And uh, so I was like, okay, it's day three of my new job. I've got my laptop and turned on, turned off third party cookies, you know, those, those glorious days. And, um, and so I, I wrote, some, uh, wrote a simple for loop because that's all I'd ever had to do before. Um, use re the glorious library requests and put an assertion in there, which when you're trying to download 2 million of anything is a terrible idea, but like I had some, you know, previous, Andrew yesterday, raise it, you know, raise exceptions. There I was, it's a terrible idea. Um, all of data science, as far as I learn it, as today, month three, just throw everything you knew about software engineering out of the window. Um, and so it took eight minutes to download 2,000 files and I did the, did the math and that's gonna be six days and I'm really impatient, so that wasn't gonna work. So then I had this sort of vague notion that there were, I could use a thread pool executor and mm, do some stuff and uh, this is one of those examples of like, I'd gone to a random PyCon talk about something that I didn't need in my day-to-day work, it wasn't, you know, I didn't understand most of it, but it sort of gave me those kind of like, that kind of background vocabulary to go and Google, you know, go and search for the right thing. And, um, and, and lo and behold, um, uh, Python have, of course, has everything built into it, and there's a nice example in the Python docs, and, uh, and it said it was going to take eight hours to get everything done, and I thought, great, I'll go to sleep and uh, wake up, and, and there it all was, all assertions gone. Um, I only had a couple of failures due to network outages, and I was able to get them. So that was a win. And then I started using Dask and PySpark to, uh, to start crunching through this data. Um, who, who's here has heard of Dask, actually? I'd be interested to, awesome. A much smaller crowd, okay. Actually, oh, and hands up for pandas. Okay, nice, okay. So Dask is, um, Dask is gonna be your friend. Pandas people, Venn diagram of knows pandas doesn't know Dask. And, um, it gives you a pandas-like API, so it gives you a data frame that's going to feel very familiar, um, but it can work with data that's, that can't fit in memory. And so it handles all of the magic of splitting that out and, and just 
working in the way you expect it to, but on much larger data sets. Um, and this, the data by the time I downloaded it was a few hundred gigs, so it was big enough to fit on my laptop, but not big enough to fit in RAM by any stretch of the imagination. So Dask is great for that. Dask also works on clusters um, with its distributed library. And then PySpark, um, Spark is a, is a big data tool that's been around for a really long time, much you know, longer and more established than the, um, than the PyData ecosystem, but Spark ends up, is, is a Scala and Java um, sort of system with a, this Python uh, wrapper around it, and we use it heavily at Mozilla, um, but for me, every time I get back a stack trace that has just a bunch of Java in it, I'm just like, I don't know why it's not working, and then I go back to Dask. And actually what I found is that the learnings that I get from using one are completely translate to the same thing because you're trying to get used to the same concepts of, of, of working with your data and thinking about it in, in ways that I didn't have to before. So I found learning them side by side to, to work pretty well. I will say that I could have read all of my data in with Spark using this one line and I didn't need that whole mess. So when you know how to use Spark, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Um, and so after much trial and tribulation, um, we, we, I got my data cleaned. Um, hat tip to the tidy data talk yesterday. I rearranged it all so that each one of my rows was a, was a JavaScript call, which is my, you know, level of observation. And, um, and I had some columns. I had arguments and I had the location that we visited. I had the, the URL of the script that was executed. Um, and I have the symbols. Symbols are things like a call to window.user agent or um, window.location or the JavaScript API that gives you your screen size and things like that. Um, and so now I had to start exploring the data, which at this, at this, this isn't really something I'd had to do professionally before. Um, and, but visualization is kind of my thing and uh, my wheelhouse. And so I turned to the world's greatest visualization library, um, but using it in a way that we haven't uh, seen yet using the bouquet server it came to life. Okay. This is not a, this is very much an exploratory analysis, um, but I wanted to show you because although it's kind of ugly and hard to see, um, it, it really was the thing that gave me uh, my first intuition. So up here I have the location. So each one of these is a location. And when I click on one of these locations, it, it lights up the locations of the, the JavaScript um, domains that the domain was written on. And so this, you know, there's a, don't worry about the size of the blocks. But what happened, the scary thing that happened was when I came down here and I went to something like, is this one of them? Yeah. You go to one of these script locations and you look back in the other direction, the direction that we don't see as users, but those companies do see, and you start to see the whole internet lighting up, and you start to realize that when you're on an individual website and you see some JavaScript and it's kind of annoying, you don't really care, but when you realize that the, the people that are serving that JavaScript can see so much of the web, and they can see you appearing here and there, and then they can really, really start to piece together, um, piece together who you are without ever, um, no cookies involved. So that was a, that was a kind of an, an aha moment of just kind of the scale of what we were dealing with. Oh yeah, we're back on the right thing. And so, um, and so, but I wanted to dig into a, like an actual sort of tracking technology and there's, um, there's one that I'd, I'd read about called canvas fingerprinting. Has ever, anybody heard of this? Um, little bit. Okay, so canvas is awesome. The thing that makes all of these, uh, the beautiful bokeh visualizations we've seen is a technology called Canvas. It's an HTML5 object that lets you draw things on the web. Um, and, and it's extremely useful. Um, but unfortunately, um, it can also be used for evil because apparently everything can. Um, and so, uh, it's been, it's been shown in the research that companies, that you can, um, you can write, you can write anything to Canvas. And every browser is slightly different. It's running on slightly different hardware. Um, you might have a different set of fonts. You might have slightly different anti-aliasing features. And what me it means that, sure, the bokeh plot is the bokeh plot is the bokeh plot, but there'll be these small differences that are subtle enough that it's a way that you can start to uniquely identify a browser. And so I'm not going to run through this um, analysis in detail. Um, I will put up the notebook for you to look at. Um, this is using Dask to run through the entire data set and to pull out just the um, calls to, to fill text, which is, uh, which is how you write text. And I'm gonna, I might break everything by doing this, but 
Here we go. And this is what we see people writing to the canvas. This is not because they wanted to make a bokeh visualization. This is not somebody writing an access label. That's, that's a smiley face. Um, that's some, some random emo emo emojis. And then all the way down here, we have the very cheeky, somebody even spelt out canvas fingerprinting to do the canvas fingerprinting. And I just thought, there is no hope for humanity. Um, and so, but it's exciting because we've, we've heard about this thing in the literature and now we can see, we went and did a big crawl and we can go and see that this technique, we can see this technique happening in the wild. Um, and if you go to, uh, if you want to learn more about this, um, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation did this uh, amazing work um, with a, a, a study they called Panopticlick. And, um, and just fingerprinting, just doing the canvas fingerprinting is, it'll uniquely identify maybe one in a thousand web browsers. But you add in what fonts you have installed, what your user agent is, are you, do you have cookies enabled? What add-ons do you have? And all of a sudden, you start to build up a picture um, where, uh, you start to pick up a picture where my browser is, is identifiable for one in two million other browsers. And all of a sudden, that might as well be, um, that might as well be an ID, and we didn't need any cookies. Um, and so now we come back to that table that I had before with that uncategorized group. Um, because disconnect me is just a list of known people that we, we want to block, but, that, these, that, market, that marketplace, that domain place, that is changing and evolving all the time. And how are we going to, can we do anything better to keep up with them? Can we use magic, also known as data science, to, um, still magic to me, um, to, to, uh, to dig into that a bit more, to not rely on um, figuring this out manually, but to, to maybe automatically detect it. And so, um, not going to spend too long on this, but um, I used uh, Spark this time, and I went and got all of my locations, all of my scripts, and those symbols, and uh, printed them out. One of the reasons, and maybe this is stupid, one of the reasons I don't like Spark is because it's just kind of ugly, and it's just, why couldn't they put it in a nice table like Pandas does? It doesn't, makes me sad. Anyway, um, so here we have, you know, we can see a call to user agent, a call to cookie, a call to get context for the HTML canvas element, and so we have that. 131 million times. And we can use, this is such a short amount of code for how long it took me to figure out how to do this, but um, now, it, next time it'll take me less time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so we can, we can pivot table this and we can end up with, um, with, with making that really wide. And so for each row is now a unique combination of a, of a location we visited and a script that was executing. Uh, executing JavaScript, and as we go along, we just have ones and zeros for did they or didn't they access this particular JavaScript uh, function. And that is in a format that, 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 the, that the magic box uh, likes. And, um, and so we can start using things like clustering algorithms um, and things that I really am only just starting to, to learn and understand. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Uh, how do I not close that again? Great. Uh, we can use clustering algorithms to uh, to see if the, the um, uh, machine learning can actually detect patterns in there of uh, fingerprinting or not fingerprinting. And so one of the first results I got from this, which made me think that maybe I'm onto something, is um, is I did just I tried to find 100 clusters with about 40% of my data. And one of the clusters it picked out, I did not give it the script and the location. I just gave it the ones and zeros. I've then, you know, backfilled this to sort of start to see if it's making making intelligent things. It picked out AdSafe protected as a as a domain. Um, it also picked out Facebook and FBCDN as a unique cluster. And those, the computer doesn't know they're linked, but we know they're linked. They have a, those domains have a business relationship. Um, and there's one, a couple more up. I think this one that also seems like it's probably like media player, which again, you can imagine that media players all have kind of a similar set of, of JavaScript calls. So I'm starting to think that there's something, there's something in this. And, uh, and it's very much still a work in progress, but as you know, we have the, uh, the world's greatest JavaScript library, um, data visualization library, Bokeh. And, um, and I'm starting to try and build out a visualization that lets us um, that lets us see these fingerprints and lets us kind of drill into them and um, and start to see if we can pick out meaningful stuff. And this is 
this is where it's at. This is not a finished piece of work. Um, this is this is something that's ongoing and that I, I hope is going to work. And at the very least, it's really pretty. Um, so, um, but I, I do think it's going to work. And so, hang on, let's close that. So, is there any hope? Um, well, uh, we have three potential areas for hope. We have technology, policy, and community. And, uh, and technology, um, you can install a browser from a company that genuinely cares about your privacy. Um, and don't only install it on your laptop, there is Firefox Focus, which comes with all the tracking protection all ready to go for your iPhone and Android things. There's uh, just regular Firefox for your phones. Um, you can use private search engines, DuckDuckGo and Quartz and others that I'm, I'm not trying to pick favorites here. Um, but think about using private, more privacy preserving search engines. Um, Google comes up an awful lot in this data set. I just, um, there was, a, there's too many examples in here. Use a VPN. That's another way of, of, uh, of helping to protect your identity. Um, use Tor. One of the interesting things that the Tor browser does, built on Firefox, of course, um, is, is it does things like it picks the least, the most common user agent to send out so that your user agent, for example, becomes not an identifying thing. And it does, it does a bunch of things like that to really help try and, um, uh, protect your identity a little bit. Um, but I'm actually not aware of any technical solution to stop this kind of um, sort of behavior-based tracking, which is once a given company has a sample of 100, maybe 200 of the websites that you've been to, it forms this unique profile of you as a person. And this has been shown in multiple sort of academic studies. And then these can all be linked back together and, and to continue to form uh, a profile of you. And this is where policy comes in. And our beloved e -mo e -e um, inbox filler, the GDPR, um, I have, I've collected 57 of these at this point. Um, fun fact from a paper that I read uh, recently, your average privacy policy, including if it chooses to make references to the third parties, will take 84 minutes to read, which means just the GDPR emails I've got is about two, two weeks worth of, of reading. Really fascinating reading as well. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, GDPR is, time. GDPR uh, is the European Union's uh, General Data Protection Regulation. And um, it's, I'm only gonna touch on it briefly. I'm, I'm gonna be working on some, some more things on it. So uh, follow me on Twitter and, or whatever to, uh, to learn more about this and, how, and things that we can learn. I'm really interested to repeat the work um, that I did with that cookie, you know, the cookie stuff at the beginning, just as a personal experiment to see how that changed. It would also be kind of cool to repeat the crawl. Um, but e the EU has long believed that in a right to privacy and a right for your data to be protected. And so if companies are processing your personally identifiable information, and 100%, I believe, this hasn't been tested in court yet, but your, your browsing history is, you know, I think personally identifiable information. Um, and if you are in the EU, and I don't mean you're an EU citizen, I mean you're literally in the EU, so I'm going to start taking like privacy vacations where I just like spend a week with my family and just assert all of my privacy rights. Um, because it's, it's a territory-based uh, right. Um, and then you have rights. You have rights to know what data companies have, to know if it's correct, to know what they're doing with it, and to, and to opt out. And not just opt out in a kind of, you can't use Facebook, or you can use Facebook opt out, but in more subtle, more meaningful ways than that. Um, and so it's just started and, and I'm really excited about it. Um, I, I do have a visualization, but I'm running out of time. It's just a map with all of those locations and scripts. Oh, we'll just do it. Everybody loves a map. That's the... Um, the uh, I took all of the locations and uh, and the scripts, and I did a I did a big who is lookup to try and find a, a territory for those domains, and and it's just a hot mess basically. It's not the prettiest thing I've ever made, but basically you can show data just leaking all of the all over the world, and that's why the global reach of um, of the of the GDPR is really exciting, and that if companies want to do business in the EU, they're going to really have to take this seriously. And what about our friends our friends at the LA Times who so kindly spawned our cookie earlier. Well, if you are in Europe and you try and go to the LA Times, you get this nice message saying they are currently uh, unable to, uh, to uh, show content in European countries and they're looking at a range of technical solutions to make that possible. And I am assuming that's because they've been doing a bunch of really 
you know, participating in, in some shady practices and they're aware that they're not, not or might not be GDPR compliant and they're going to have to do something about it. So that's kind of interesting. And so the third piece of this is, uh, is the community, is us. Um, we, we don't have to just sit back passively and, and take it. We can educate uh, ourselves and others. We can get involved. We can stand up for our rights. Um, we can complain on Twitter. I, uh, I was really annoyed. I turned off uh, on my other, my personal laptop, I have third party cookies off, you'll be surprised to hear. And I couldn't log into this site that I, I actually pay money to. And so I wrote them a little grumpy note on Twitter and, and they fixed it. it could, they, they sent me a thing, it said, please, it, it gave detailed instructions of how to re-enable third party cookies on every browser possible. And I, I said, that's not, that's not okay. Um, and so they are working on a proper technical fix, but in the meantime, they've changed the instructions to just add an exception for Kickstarter, which is, you know, a company I have a relationship with and I'm kind of okay with that as a, as a stopgap. So, you know, be grumpy on Twitter. Um, and also, and I'm really excited uh, to share this with you today, uh, coincide, um, coinciding and because of, of me being here today and speaking at PyCon Israel, we are open sourcing the uh, overscripted data set. Um, if you go, I hope they timed it all right, like it wasn't up just before I got online. So if you go to uh, uh, GitHub, Mozilla Overscripted Data Analysis Challenge, um, you can go and get that data yourself and you can start digging and, and exploring and, um, and, and trying to see if you can build new insights. Um, um, and collaborate with me and you know like I said earlier I, I welcome feedback and and um, and thoughts on how we can do this better what's the right kind of clustering or other kinds of learning and and how can we really what are all the useful things that we can dig out of this and if you're not motivated enough by the altruism of not being spied on um, there are prizes. Uh, the top three analyses will be invited to uh, speak at and um, present their work at MozFest 2018 with uh, expenses paid to London to come and visit um, with us and to present. Uh, MozFest is a festival for the open internet. About 2,000 people get together from all over the world to discuss and collaborate and hack and, um, and it's awesome. And uh, yeah, and we would love to have you there. And so we invite you to Go check out the GitHub repo, um, download the data, and start hacking on it. Um, thanks. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter at @birdsarah, and I hopefully look forward to seeing some of you in, in London. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a few minutes for questions. Oh, yep, sure. The question is, Twitter's not helping the privacy situation, and there are other options. Um, I, can you tweet me the information about the other things? I didn't quite catch the name of the, no, I'm serious. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious in the sense that, uh, this is going to be a thing that I really think about. A few years ago, I, I fully got myself off Google. I got off Google Calendar, Google Gmail, blah, 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 and I, and I Getting off Google Calendar was the, weirdly the hardest, like, um, and so I ended up having to run my own own cloud server to do this. So I'm definitely interested in, in alternatives out there. And so, yes, uh, you don't have to tweet me. You come and find me and, and I'll, I'll learn more about that. Uh, other questions? Sure. Oh, I will just say I would love a question from a woman or a first time PyCon attendee, um, but. Yay, okay, good. The question was, can I talk about the, the sort of mass societal level effects of, of these kind of privacy intrusions? Um, and my boss and I had the same sort of dynamic. I don't, I don't know what it is about my background, maybe it's from social justice, working with marginalized communities, all this kind of stuff, uh, but um, there's so many angles to hear about the weaponization of information and how it affects individuals and it especially affects um, various kinds of marginalized communities. Um, but you're absolutely right that the, there is a, um, w we live in a world where we now really understand that um, all of these tools can be used to um, affect how we think collectively in ways that are really uh, troubling and I don't think we fully understand and, and have had the ability to sort of step away from yet. Um, when I was doing the research, 
So one of the things that was interesting about this research is the more I sort of dug into it, the more I found older and older articles. Snowden was talking about Ever cookies and, and the possibility of, you know, and the NSA using them to like identify Tor users and this kind of stuff. And the conversation a few years ago, and the re even the academic research a few years ago was about how state actors can do these kind of surveillance. But now they don't need to because uh, the advertising industry has got it covered and I'm sure they can get access to that information anytime they want to. And we, by buying shoes and whatever we buy on the internet. I don't actually own that many pairs of shoes, even though this is the second time today I've mentioned buying shoes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, I think, I think the other thing that the, 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 the social conversation, the other thing I think that's interesting about it is um, those actors are somewhat known and they're somewhat, there's, there's international diplomacy and there, there's state actors and there's, there's these conversations like that. For me, it's much more sinister that there is just hundreds of billions of dollars and tens of thousands of small companies that you've never heard of and they will keep popping up, completely unregulated, just running amok. And um, so yeah, choose what to be afraid of, but it's all horrifying. Um, yeah, uh, well, I think we have time for one more question. Seem. Uh, yes. Is that worth right. So private browsing. Uh, you know. Uh, there's a couple of sides to it. One, uh, there's a there's a funny XKCD KCD which talks, you know, which basically just says as soon as you've browsed more than a few websites, you're, it's not your private browser anymore because you're just using it as your regular browser. Those those cookies continue to accumulate in your private browser until you close it, and then they sort of automatically get wiped. And private browsing mode in Chrome and Firefox and Others has more tracking protection kind of automatically turned on for you. Um, but the the origin of sort of private browsing, at least how I think about it, is you know, people were using Internet Explorer at work to look at porn and they didn't want their boss to know, and so it like automatically deletes your browsing history. And it's not that's not where your browsing history lives anymore. And so I'm not aware of I do think it's worth something, and I do regularly use private browsing. The Firefox focus browser on your phone, it doesn't give you multiple tabs. You just have one tab, you can go there, and as soon as you close it, everything gets deleted. And I've actually found that that wasn't that hard to get used to on a phone as a way of working. But that's not going to really work for me on a desktop, so I don't see myself really getting off regular browsing mode on the desktop. So um, you can do your own research. You can, you know, you can go and see how much you think you're being stalked. You can reuse this data, um, and I would love to hear back if that's the answer. And it is 10.14, so we should stop. Thank you so much.